started here in just a, <clears throat> a moment. Well, I got one more week as a bachelor. <laughs> and then I hope that phrase, a bachelor till a rapture, doesn't occur <laughs> between now and then. <laughs> Actually, that wouldn't be bad. Um, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about that. <laughs> no. Miss her a lot. But uh, she's helping out there, and it's a good thing. You know, the only thing is she's going to have a stack of laundry to do, I'm telling you. I just go out and buy more stuff. That's how I get by. <laughs> I won't say anything about that. <laughs> first of all, what dinners did she prepare? That's the first question. Yeah, I can, I can do some things. Yeah, but I, I eat out and I go, I go down to Martin's and I get stuff, you know, and bring it home. They got a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, for a reasonable price, and uh, that's good. Okay, let's go ahead and begin. You know, this is not the greatest setting for a class, you know what I mean? But I'm just trying to be cooperative with our, our bigger picture of what we're doing here at church. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I'm the one who opened my big mouth and volunteered. <laughs> but anyway, they need the rooms. So that's a good thing. Yeah, and, and, but it's not the greatest setting. But, but we'll make it work as best we can. Uh, want to be a team player. Anyway, we want to pray because we are a class, okay? We are, we are a class. We want to pray for one another. Is there anything in particular, a way that we can pray? Let me just mention, let's continue to remember. Pen oh, I didn't know he was in the hospital. Chuck Miller. Oh, I didn't know Chuck was in. I talked to them every once in a while. Oh. Okay. No, I didn't know that. I don't know. I'll have to find out. Of course, I just got an email from the hospital saying that, man, they've really tightened up restrictions. I cannot go and visit there. <clears throat> it is uh, very limited. And um, so, anyway... Let's remember um, Wayne Huda. He had knee surgery, his second knee surgery, and he's at home recovering. So just think of Wayne as he does that, and uh, Penny. Okay, let's continue to remember Penny. I mean, it's only been, I don't know how many weeks now, but I know she, we just need to pray for friend Penny, okay? Oh, good. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Right. I just think we need to remember these folks and let them know we prayed for them, okay? Wayne, Penny, uh, I, um, John, and Char, do you have anything on Ike? And no? Yeah, me too. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Ike and Shelby. Okay, is there anything else we can remember in prayer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't be, don't, there's a massive campaign out there 
nationwide to discourage you from voting. They want to suppress it. They want, they want you to think it's all over with, okay? And don't believe that if it's not true. Because what you see on the ground is different than what they're telling you. So don't believe that stuff. Get out, do our civic responsibility, and every vote does count. People, you know, Christians don't vote. It's terrible. I don't know what. And then they, they do a lot of whining and complaining. They don't vote. Your vote is needed. It is, it is especially this time. So um, let's do it. All right, we will do that. And um, anything else? Okay, could I have, uh, could I ask uh, uh, one or two, and then I'll pray for our class as we dive into this great passage in Philippians. Wow. Oh, man. Let's pray. S someone begin, please. <clears throat> Father, I pray for your protection over our country. We, in many respects, don't deserve it. But we ask, as your people, we ask that you would, in mercy and grace, protect us. And I pray that believers would be prompted to do their civic duty, get out there and vote. And we just lift this whole thing up to you. We pray that the vote will be decisive and clear. I pray, Lord, that those that are seeking to cheat would be exposed in whatever state or city they're in. All these efforts to cheat and to uh, stack the ballots and, and all those things. I pray that you'd help this to be exposed, that this would not happen, that it would be found out, and, uh, and uh, we would not have to go on week after week after week waiting to hear. Pray that it would be decisive and clear. We pray for our country, as there probably is going to be, no matter what happens, there's probably going to be some civil unrest. I just ask for your protection over that, and that it would not be that type of thing. <clears throat> so we lift up to you uh, our country. We ask for your mercy on us. I want to uh, ask Lord for Wayne Huda. Thank you for Wayne. I appreciate him. His many years, decades of service as a missionary in radio and the things he's done because he loves you. And he's given his life. I think of his wife, Esther, who now for many years is in your presence. And we know it's been different for Wayne. And we just ask for your grace for him. Thank you for his daughter, Ruth, his son, Jim, who have been there helping him. And Steve, and we're thankful that they have a loving family that is helping their dad. Now help us in our class today. What, we, we're stepping into the Holy of Holies in the, this letter to the Philippians, in this awesome passage of Scripture. Help us to appreciate it in a new, fresh, deeper way. In Jesus' name, amen.
<clears throat> Philippians chapter 2. And here we are. Did, wait, something. Oh, I know what I did. Um, I need to. Alan, would you go up to the computer and push? You know where it says pulpit? And then, yeah, push it down here because. And then we'll get this up here. Okay. I want to begin with something. You notice in your notes. A congregation in a certain church in Dallas, Texas, was at one time divided. The division became so serious that each faction entered a lawsuit against the other to dispossess it from the church and to claim the church property for itself. <laughs> this litigation came into the newspapers and many people watched the court proceedings with high interest. The judge finally ruled it the judge finally ruled it was not in the province of the civil court to settle this matter until it had been it had first been aired before the church courts. So the matter was referred to the higher authorities in the denomination. Evid eventually, a church court assembled to hear both sides of this case. Later, the high judiciary of the denomination made its decision and awarded the church property to one of the two factions. The losers withdrew and formed another church in the area. It was reported in the newspaper for all Dallas to read that in tracing this squabble to its source, the church court found the trouble began when an elder at a church dinner received a smaller slice of ham than a child seated next to him. Can you imagine what a good time the people of Dallas had laughing at Jesus Christ on that occasion? Our Lord said, speaking to the disciples in the upper room, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to the other. Now, that comes from a reputable commentary. So I have no reason to doubt. I don't know what church they're talking about. I don't even know if it happened. I'm assuming it did. But that's just, I'm sure that could repeat it, be repeated over again. But in Ephesians, Philippians, when Epaphroditus brought a generous gift from the church in Philippi to Paul in Rome, that's what did. This is a thank you letter, among other things. When Epaphroditus brought the gift from the church in Philippi, and he also brought good news of the church's concern for the Apostle Paul. Epaphroditus also brought the bad news of possible division in the church family at Philippi. You pick that up when you read this, especially our passage here today. And and Philippians chapter 4, when it talks about those two ladies. Okay? I'm sure there were more involved than just those two ladies. But his strong appeal in verses 1 through 4 of our passage, Philippians 2, his strong appeal suggests he was more than a little concerned that the church's future was under threat. And apparently there was a double threat to unity of this church False teachers coming in from without. By the way, very similar to the Galatians. Notice Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. He says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. He says, watch out for those dogs. Those men who do evil. Those mutilators. Of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision. We who worship by the spirit of God. Who glory in Christ Jesus. And who put no confidence in the flesh. The NIV has study Bible has some interesting thoughts. He calls them dogs. Watch out for those dogs. A harsh word for Paul's opponents. Showing their aggressive opposition to the gospel like wild dogs, okay? And the seriousness of their error and its destructive 
results. Their teaching was probably similar to what Paul had to oppose in the Galatian churches. He calls them mutilators of the flesh. Again, a very strong, painfully vivid term. The false teachers have so distorted the meaning of circumcision that it has become nothing more than a useless cutting of the body. And that's where he says in Philippians, why don't they go all the, all the whole way and emasculate themselves? It, it, they had so perverted the meaning of circumcision from Genesis 17 as a sign of God's covenant with Abraham that um, he says these harsh things. So one of, the, one of their problems was they too, the Philippian congregation, were, were being pressured or had the potential of being pressured by the Judaizers, these dogs, these mutilators of the flesh. But also, they had a problem of disagreeing members. Uh, look at chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. My brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Suntyche, those are feminine words, to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. These people needed to have intervention. There needed to be help. Help them. But evidently, they, there was disagreement there, and we see this from Philippians 2. Let's read the first four verses of Philippians 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then, if that's true, if you have any of these things, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. <clears throat> well, let's, let's just stop there. Philippians chapter 2 is one of the great uh, probably one of the best known parts of the book of Philippians. And um, remember our, our chart here, Philippians, to live is Christ, to die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Christology, the person and work of Jesus Christ, is, is a large theme in the book of Philippians. We see in Philippians chapter 1 that Christ is our life. That's where that verse comes from. For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Christ is our life. And the aim and the goal of as a believer is to exalt, to magnify Christ in life or in death. To exalt him, to magnify him. Kind of like a telescope. You know, you look out there and you see these pinpoints, you know, of light out there in the universe. Some of those are galaxies, folks. And they look so small. And we just look at these pinpoints. But through a 200-inch telescope out there in California, wherever it is, you know, the, uh, or the Hubble Space Telescope out in space doesn't have any of the, our Earth's atmosphere. This big Hubble Space Telescope, and they look out into the galaxy, and these little pinpoint things that we see from the Earth are actually billions of star galaxies. And um, we, that, it's through that telescope that we get to see how really big and glorious and amazing these things are. Well, to most people in this world, most people you rub shoulders with, Jesus Christ is a pinpoint prick in the galaxy. Just a small little thing, has no relevance in their life. They never even consider God, Jesus they live their lives. They live according to the course of this world. 
And as far as they're concerned, he's just a pinpoint. Yeah, we know about him, and we know there's churches and stuff like that. But we are to exalt and magnify Jesus Christ. We're to make the Lord look as big as he really is. Not bigger than he is, big as he really is. You know what I mean? And our aim is to exalt Christ by life or by death. Now we move to Philippians chapter 2. Christ is our pattern. Our aim is to have the mind of Christ in humility. And what is so amazing to me was when you compare verses 1 through 4 with verse 5 through 11. One of the greatest passages on theology, on Christology, about the Lord Jesus Christ, on his, humili hu his humiliation, his exaltation, one of the greatest theological passages on the Lord Jesus Christ is given as an example for us to live this way in our lives and in our churches. You, you follow what I'm saying here? I mean, talk about the relationship between theology and application and living out our faith in this church, in a committee meeting, in a board meeting, in a congregational meeting, just functioning as a congregation. There are people out there that are going to offend you. What are you going to do with it? The example of the Lord Jesus Christ, verses 5 through 11, and this amazing passage of scripture about the incarnation, the exaltation of our Lord Jesus Christ. What brought him here um, is used as it's supposed to be our pattern and our example as we flesh out relationships in the church. There was obviously some issues in Philippians, among the Philippians that Epaphroditus made Paul aware of. And so he's writing to these people. And the first thing, um, we got to have a servant's heart. And um, he encourages them to look in three directions. Here we go. A very strong appeal. Here's the first look. We're to look at, he says, look at yourself. Look at yourself. Notice the if clauses. <clears throat> the if clauses here. Four times. If you have any encouragement. If any comfort. If any fellowship. If any tenderness. Now, these are, these are what we call first class conditional clauses. I'm not going to give an English or a Greek lesson, but they are first class. And what they mean is this. What Paul is saying is this. He doesn't mean, it's not the if of doubt, if you have any encouragement. Now, there's some doubt there, but I'm just asking if. That's not the if of doubt. That is a, that's the third class condition. This is the first class condition. It is the, it's the if of argument. If this is true in your life, and it is, I know it is, he's saying. If this is a reality, then this is how you must behave. He's reminding them of who they are and what he knew about them. It's not the if of doubt. Am I making my point? The if of certainty. Yeah, 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 that's great. I was just going to say that. That's right. And it's, it's the idea of since this is true. Yeah, that's a great way to say it. Since this is true. Okay, so let's read it that way. Look at yourself. If you have any, or since. Okay, here we go. What about, do you get, do you folks get any encouragement from your union with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection? In your identification with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death to sin, in his resurrection? Because all believers are, are united with Christ in his death and resurrection, right? Right? That's, that's huge. We are in Christ. Is there any encouragement living in this world, this broken world, that comes from that in your life? There ought to be, if you're saved, especially as you learn about it. So he's saying, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, and he's assuming that that is true, okay? Then, if that's so, if that's true... This should compel you to preserve the unity that is so precious to the Lord. It should compel you, if that's true, 
to preserve the unity that's so precious to him. Let's go to the second one. If there is any comfort that comes from his love, does the love of God embrace you in the darkest moments of life? The answer, the assumption is yes. We receive as believers comfort and strength and help from God's love and that we're, we're secure in Christ and he loves us. If, if you get any help from that, any comfort in, in difficult times, in dark times from that truth, then if that's true, this should compel you to preserve the unity that's so precious to him. Thirdly, if you have any fellowship with the Spirit. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit has come to live within you? Your body is his temple. And he has brought you into the family of God by the new birth. Do you have any... Remember, how do we live our Christian life? Walk by means of the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Is there any fellowship that you have with the Spirit of God... And the answer is yes. That's the, that's the answer. If there's any fellowship, and there is, he says, if that's true, this should compel you to preserve the unity that is so precious to him. And then one last one. If there is any tenderness and compassion, he's asking them, has the love of Christ melted your heart, making you more aware of other people and their needs? Creating you within you a tenderness toward folks, a compassion to those in need. Does the love of Christ poured out in your hearts create any of this? The answer is what? Yes. He knows these people. He says, well, if that's so, this should compel you to preserve the unity that is so precious to him. And that brings us to verse 2. Notice the ifs in verse 1. There are four of them, right? And then... Verse 2, so then, if that's true, and it is, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. If these things are true, then you must make my joy complete, Philippians, by being, you're, you as people need to be like-minded, having the same love, being one, in spirit and purpose. I like uh, what Harry Ironside from Chicago, pastor at Moody Memorial Church at one time, he says it is very evident that Christians will never see eye to eye on all points. By the way, unity is not uniformity. Okay, The only way, time you get uniformity is in donut shops. Okay, as they, you know, or whatever they, and, and donut shops. That's where you get uniformity. But unity is not uniformity. It's very evident Christians will never see eye to eye on all points. We are so largely influenced by habits, by environment, by education, by the measure of intellectual and spiritual apprehension to which we have attained that it is an impossibility to find any number of people who look at everything from the same standpoint. How then can such be of one mind? The apostle himself explains it elsewhere when he says, I think also that I have the mind of Christ. See, there's the secret. The mind of Christ is the lowly mind. And if we are all of this mind, we shall walk together in love, considering one another, seeking rather to be helpers of one another's faith, rather than challenging each other's convictions. We must have the mind of Christ. And that's what he's going to talk about in verse 5. Your mind, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So, <clears throat> he says, look at yourself. Okay? Then, secondly, verses 3 and 4. Man, I'm not going to get through this. Verses 3 and 4. Look at other people. Three, do nothing out of selfish ambition 
or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So Paul suggests two ways in which Christian believers at Philippi should view others in the church. One is with humility, verse 3. Okay, but in humility, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. See, the opposite of humility is selfishness, is selfish ambition and vain conceit. So let's look at those two things. Never let selfish ambition or vain conceit control you. Now, one of those is a symptom, and that is selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. It's one of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5.20. He says these are the works of the flesh. One of them is selfish ambition. It speaks of a party spirit being factious. You know what I mean by factious? Factions. It's, it's a factious mentality. Um, Philippians 1.17 he talks about these preachers. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely, thinking they can stir up trouble for me. These people were in competition with the Apostle Paul. They were glad he was in prison. They were ambitious. For what? I don't know, but very self-centered. They were not sincere. They, they were hoping they could stir up trouble for him. I don't know. You know, it goes on all the time in ministry. I'm not saying, I'm not making excuses for it. I'm just telling you. It's the party spirit. It has to do with, fa with faction in the church that wants to promote its aims, its ambitions, as, the po as opposed to another group. And the root cause is vain conceit. The root cause is vain conceit. Keno doxia. Ken, that's the Greek word. Keno doxia. Vain glory. It's doxia, doxology, glory. But keno, which means vain or empty. It's empty glory. It has to do with personal vanity, self promotion. Someone in a position of leadership trying to build a personal following for his own. His own faction, okay? Trying to promote himself or herself. It's vain glory, vain conceit. That's where selfish ambition comes from. But he says, consider others more important than yourselves. Okay? Um, oh, I'm, I'm no longer, I'm, I'm in Philippians 1. Yeah, consider others more important than yourselves. In humility. By the way, the word in humility is an interesting word. It, it's composed of two. It means lowliness of mind. To have a lowly mind. A humility before God, which leads to a humility in our relationships with other people. Lowliness of mind. <clears throat> okay. He also says not only with humility, but with unselfishness. Verse 4. Look at verse 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests. Okay. That's selfish. My way or the highway. My way or the highway. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Try to listen to people. Try to understand where they're coming from. Give it your best effort to at least try to understand. Unselfishness. So, so there's, the, there's the deal. You know, look, look at yourself and look at others. Look at yourself. Do you have any encouragement from being in Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship with the Spirit? Any compassion? Any tenderness? And he's... These are first-class conditions. Of course you do, Philippians. And if that's true, then you need to make as primary, as important, 
in, in your lives and in your church life, this issue of working together, because that's very important to the Lord. And then he says, look at, your, look at other people with humility, lowly, lowliness of mind, and with unselfishness. Look to their interests, too. Try to figure them out. Try to at least hear people. It's not always my way or the highway. All right. Now we come to this. Look at Jesus. Okay? Look at yourself. Look at others. Look at Jesus. Paul turns to the finest example of servanthood of, of what he's promoting here. The finest example that has ever been given, that is, has ever been lived out, and that's the Lord Jesus. And he paints a vivid portrait of Jesus by quoting a very, it, this could be a early Christian hymn. It, it's, it's widely agreed by New Testament experts that verses 6 through 11 could well be an early Christian hymn. And you know how they know, how you know that? Because of the way they said it in the text. How many of you have in your Bible, verse 6 through 11, kind of set off in a special way. Yeah, okay. Some Bibles don't do that, but some do. The NIV does. It's set off in a different way, like a quote. It could well be an early Christian hymn, or it could well be an early Christian creed or confession that Paul incorporated in. But it could well as it could very well be that he composed these lines by himself. He was quite capable of doing this. Okay, We know from 1 Corinthians, that chapter on love. If I have the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm, it's, that's a brilliant passage. So it could well be. We don't know exactly, but they are set apart because they could be an early Christian hymn or an early Christian creed or confession. But regardless of the precise origin... The passage provides us with the finest and most moving passage the Apostle Paul ever wrote about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and what he's going to lay out here about the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to be the way I live every single day of my life. Whether I'm in a board meeting, in a committee, whether I'm just in life of the church, whether we're planning something in my home with my wife, with my children, I'm supposed to have the, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. I mean, you belong to him, don't you? Right? But your attitude should be the same. And so this great theological passage, this Christological passage about these Fabulous truths that he reveals here. I mean, journal articles and books have been written on this passage. Is applied just to how we live. Because we're supposed to have this mind, this attitude. Okay, so the first thing he talks about in verses 6 through 8 is the humiliation of the Son of God. The humiliation of the Son of God. Look at verse 6. Well, verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider him equality with God, something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So, when we think of the self-humiliation of the Son of God, there are three steps that brought him from heaven to the cross. Three steps in this self-humiliation of the eternal, co-equal, co-eternal Son of God. Three steps. The first step is this. One of the things he did was, right at first, he forgot himself. He forgot himself. So what do you mean? He forgot himself. Well, verse 6, Jesus' situation in heaven before coming to this world, 
before coming into this world is the focus of verse 6. Look at it again. Who, being in very nature God or being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, held on to. So he forgot himself. Now there are three things I'm going to give to you or mention that are not that are all under point number one. I didn't put them in the notes. Okay, but first of all, notice first the nature of the pre-incarnate Son of God, pre-incarnate before he became man, the pre-incarnate Son of God for all eternity. Paul puts it succinctly by telling us that the Son of God was in the form of God or in very nature God. Okay, as I said, who being in very nature God or who being in the form of God. He possessed the essential nature, character, and attributes of deity. And the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, the Son of God, is coexistent, co-eternal, co-equal with God. His existence didn't begin in Bethlehem's manger or in Mary's womb. The only thing that began with Mary was the visible manifestation of the Son. For the first time, God became flesh and blood. So that who, being in very nature God, emphasizes the pre-incarnate nature of the Son of God. Co-equal, co-eternal in the, in the triunity of the Godhead. Notice the glory of the pre-incarnate Son of God. It says, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. What do you mean? Equality with God. Well, as the second person of the Godhead, the eternal Son of God enjoyed all the rights and privileges, the glories and the splendor, the trappings, the prerogatives of deity. For one thing, he was the object of angelic and human worship. He was not only co-equal to God, he existed in a manner, a form that's equal to God, sheltered from all the woes associated with this sin-cursed world, all the glories, all the prerogatives of deity were his. How did, and therefore we have to think, how did the son respond to existing in a manner equal with God? How did he respond to that? Well, look what it says. He did not consider equality with God, what? Something to be grasped, held on to. Um, this is mine, I'm not going to give it up. It was not necessary. That's the attitude. That's the mind. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus' attitude was not, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to hold on to it. He knew that the rights and privileges of the trappings of glory, the prerogatives of deity, however you want to put it, that he enjoyed were not necessary components of deity. And he was willing to set them aside. He did not set aside his deity. But all the trappings, the prerogatives, the glories of his pre-incarnate state were not necessary. And so the bottom line is this. He was willing to set them aside. In other words, he forgot himself. So I have to think about me in my relationship with my sweetheart and how I treat her. Is it all about me and my demands, my wants? Do I ever forget myself? I'm talking about you, Chris. What does forgetting myself look like? 
is, it is, all, is it always what I want to do when I want to do it? Same thing in church as a pastor. What is forgetting myself in a Christian congregation look like? Well, he forgot himself. The second thing he did, back page. Here's the second step in his humiliation. Self-humiliation, by the way. He emptied himself. That's verse 7. But he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. That's the NIV translation. He emptied himself. Or made himself nothing. By the way, the Greek verb literally means, it comes from kanao, which means to empty. That's the, that's the meaning of the verb, to empty. That's the way it's translated in the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the New Revised Standard Version. He emptied himself. That's the most literal translation. It does. What does it mean that the pre-incarnate Son of God emptied himself? Well, the NIV, trying to explain or unpack this self-emptying doesn't help much. I mean, the fact that they say he made himself nothing, to me, that's not helpful. I don't think that's the best translation. The New Living Translation helps a little bit more. They translate it this way. He gave up his divine privileges. Ah, I can grab a hold of that a little bit better. He gave up his divine privileges. The English version, or the Good News Bible, same thing, reads, of his own free will, he gave up all he had. If anyone ever had the right to insist on his rights, it was the Lord Jesus. But his concern for others, especially, and especially for those whom the Father had given to him, his concern for others and particularly those whom the Father had given to him, was such that he refused to insist on his rights. He did not cling to his divine prerogatives, but willingly laid aside all the trappings of his glory and took on our humanity. Theologians call this the incarnation, in the flesh. It's crucial for us to understand, though, that in doing this, he did not cease to be God. God cannot cease to be God. He rather laid aside the glories and riches of heaven, the prerogatives, the trappings. He laid aside the independent exercise of his authority, the independent exercise and attributes and submitted himself to the Father's will and added our humanity to his deity. So he was at one and the same time fully God and fully man. Whew. Think about that. He emptied himself. Taking the very form or the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Now, this self-emptying involved some dramatic changes in our Lord's position and state. Would you say? Think about it. Would you say there were some changes that occurred? Oh, my. Uh, yes. Here's, let me share with you some of them. There was a change in his dwelling place. That's the first one there, point A. A change in his dwelling place. He went from heaven to earth. What a drastic change. Jesus left the comfort, the splendor of heaven, came to this earth. What a drastic change that must have been. Paul wrote, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. And yet the Son of God willingly gave up the trappings of his deity, took our humanity, came to earth for me, for us. It might be good, you know, it might be good to think about that hymn, um, And Can It Be? He left his father's throne above. Remember that passage or that verse? 
but he, he, there was a change in his dwelling place. Secondly, point B, there was a change in his possessions. He went from riches to poverty. Riches to poverty. In heaven, the Son of God was rich. When he came into the world, he became poor. He was not born into a wealthy man's home where all material things might be his, everything he wanted. His earthly existence was characterized by poverty. He was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, by the way, was not New York City. You understand what I mean? It was, the prophet Micah said, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be even counted among the towns in Judea. I mean, on the list of the register of all the towns, Bethlehem was too small to even be mentioned. Born in Bethlehem. His parents were not wealthy or influential people. They were common folk. He was raised in Nazareth. That was a despised... Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In other words, he had no permanent, he didn't own anything. In 2 Corinthians 8, Paul wrote, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. There was a change in his possessions. Thirdly, there was a change in his glory. He went from glory to obscurity. Glory to obscurity. Before the incarnation, our Lord's pre-incarnate existence was characterized by glory and splendor. He basked in the trappings, prerogatives of glory. The saints and angels worshipped him. However, things changed at the moment of his incarnation. He went from glory to obscurity. Jesus, I mean, the Apostle John wrote, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, but what? They didn't recognize him. The world knew him not. Didn't recognize him. He came to unto his own. Jewish people. His own did not receive him. Jesus was born, raised, lived, ministered, and died in obscurity. Even extra-biblical literature that is extant, that we have from that time, that survives to this day, extra-biblical literature of that time, around the time of Christ's birth, life, and ministry, is silent as to his existence or influence. Fourth, there was a change in his position from acknowledged equality with God to servanthood. Acknowledged equality with God to servanthood. In heaven, his equality with God the Father was acknowledged. When Jesus came to the world, he wasn't born into a home of nobility or royalty. His station in life was that of a servant. A servant is characterized not so much as a person to be despised, but as someone without rights. A servant submits himself to the will of his master. Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? Serve. And give his life a ransom for many. And then lastly, there was a change in his form. From the form of God to the likeness of in order for the Son of God to be our Savior, he had to assume our human nature, flesh, and form. And the writer to the Hebrews says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now, you know what's so exciting? He emptied himself about all these changes. You know what's so exciting? Of these five changes in our Lord's position and state, only, only the last one is permanent. Only the last one is permanent. The rest were temporary. Our Lord has returned to heaven. Amen? Yeah? 
He has received back his riches, prerogatives, trappings of deity. He is once again worshipped by saints and angels in heaven. He no longer occupies the position of a servant, but has been exalted to the highest place and occupies a position of power, prestige, and privilege to which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But the Lord's assumption of our humanity is permanent. Forever. He is the God-man. He is and always will be th throughout eternity the God-man Jesus Christ. And we can only say thank you, Lord, that God has become man. And that will always be true. And it is true right now in heaven. His physical resurrection body, he is in it, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And then there's one last thing in his self-humiliation. He forgot himself. He emptied himself. One more thing. Verse 8. He humbled himself. Verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know what? Um, there is something shocking and offensive about this death, about this kind of death. There's something very shocking, even death on a cross. You know, we, we have these things in beautiful stained glass, right? There's the cross. We have necklaces, right? Gold necklaces, silver, whatever it is. We have little bracelets. We've got all these crosses. And the cross is not an offense to us. But in this day, people knew what a cross was. They didn't wear them around their necks. They didn't have them on bracelets. They didn't have church buildings. A cross was something that brought terror to people. It was something shameful. It was something people didn't talk about. It was something that people most likely had seen a crucifixion. So when it says he humbled himself and became obedient to death, he adds the phrase, even death on a cross. He adds that for a reason. What was so, there was something shocking and offensive about the son's death. A, B, and C, here they are. I'm going to end with this. To the Jews. It was shocking, offensive to the Jews. Death on a cross was a sign that someone was under God's curse. Deuteronomy 21, 23. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The cross of Christ, because of that, became a stumbling block to the Jews. You mean the Messiah? They, the son of David that is going to come is Jesus of Nazareth? And he was hung on a cross? To the Jews, the preaching of the cross is a what? A stumbling block. That the Messiah would be nailed to a cross on a tree and hung there. To the Greeks, it was ridiculous, foolish, that a so-called powerful God should die such a humiliating death. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, what? Foolishness. <laughs> that this so-called God that became man, this, this powerful God, should be taken by men and nailed to a cross? That's nonsense. Who wants to worship a God like that? Weak. Vulnerable to man's whims. And to be hung on a cross, to the Romans, the word cross was an obscenity. You could not mention it in polite company. Death by crucifixion was unlawful for a Roman citizen. A Roman citizen could not be crucified. They wouldn't do that to a Roman citizen. It was a form of crucifixion reserved for slaves and criminals. What I'm saying is that death on a cross was the most offensive way to men that God could have chosen to procure our salvation. And, and, 
and I'll get to this. In, I'll get to this in the sermon next week. Okay, but what's so offensive about the message of the cross? But listen, Paul says the preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing what foolishness, but to us who are saved it is the power of God. What Galatians chapter five verse eleven talks about the offense of the cross. What is so offensive about the cross? Can I mention three things? It offends our pride. It allows no place for man's merit, man's attainment, man's understanding, man's effort. We can contribute in this. We can do it ourselves. We work together with what God did in Jesus at the cross. We have a part in it. No, no. It offends man's pride. No one's going to boast. Secondly, it offends man's wisdom. What's wrong with the world? And what would people say today as they look at the world? craziness of it. What's wrong with people? Proper diagnosis always precedes effective cure. This is where man gets it completely wrong. The world identifies the problem as being informational. We need better education. We need another program. We need more teachers. It's educational one. We just need this new program at school. It's experiential. It's because of people's experience. They've got to go back in their past and find out all, all this stuff that's caused them to be the way they are. So violent, murderers, rapists, it's their experience. The way they were raised. Where they were raised. It's biological or chemical. They must be chemically imbalanced. The world has all kinds of reasons why people do what they do. And they got a victim mentality. Everyone's a victim. We're not responsible for anything. It's either biological, chemical, environmental, uh, experiential, or educational. The Bible says that there's another issue, and that it's a very core, fundamental problem about us, and that is sin. We are rebels. We're born with a, at the very core, fundamental heart is the problem. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So it offends our wisdom. And lastly, it offends our values. You know, the invitation is extended to who? The powerful and the weak, the rich and the poor. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you are. Everyone comes to salvation the same way. Amen? You come as a sinner to the cross and embrace the gift that God has given you. There's no special deals, no special favors, no, no uh, exemptions for the powerful and wealthy of this world. No, no. It is God's provision. It's at the cross. And you come as a sinner. And if you don't, you don't, you don't receive it. You won't receive it. You come the same way. So it offends our sense of value. Okay, that's the humiliation of the Son of God. And we'll touch on the exaltation of the Son before we move on. Thank you, our Father. What a passage of Scripture that connects just living life with people in the church, in the home, in our jobs, wherever. Just living life, especially in the family of God. And all of a sudden, this powerful passage, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ. And, Lord, it just humbles us to realize that we are supposed to be Christ-like. And what he did in leaving heaven and humbling himself is the way we're supposed to react and respond to people in the family of God. So help us to make sure the rubber meets the road here <clears throat> as far as our relationships with people. Help us to have the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, praise the Lord, huh? Powerful. We'll uh, continue that next week in Philippians.